I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them and then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything. And he loves you. Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. We are so thankful you're with us today. Thank you for standing up with us. If you're watching online, let us know where you're watching from. Today's going to be an incredible day. Let's sing together. Let's sing together today. Nothing's impossible for our God. Just one word. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat.
Jesus, we thank you for knowing us, knowing our hearts and knitting us together. We're created with a purpose. Thank you, Jesus, for that.
give you all the praise, God. We thank you that you would leave the 99 for the one. Jesus, that you chase us down. God, even when we're running from you, God, even when we don't want to come to you, God, you, you care for us, you love us, you chase us down. There's nothing that you wouldn't do to be close to each and every one of us, God. Your love for us is great. God, and that is the prayer this morning that we leave here, knowing that one truth, that there is nothing that can keep us from your love. Jesus, it's a beautiful truth. We thank you so much, and we give you all the praise this morning. It's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen. For just a moment as we get ready to go into the next uh, part of our service, as Chris gets on to teach, uh, we just want to take a moment. You can sit down. Um, we just want to take a moment and just pray for all those who are going through the crisis over in the Ukraine. Um, or, um and, and, and we just want to seek God and just ask him to just, uh, to just, be, just be present uh, and to bring his peace. And so real quick, would you just pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we, we thank you for who you are. God, today we recognize and we remember that, God, you are God and we are not. That you are above all things, that you are in all things, and that every authority, every power will bow down before you. And so, God, we thank you for that this morning. God, we pray for the families uh, of those who have lost uh, loved ones in the midst of this crisis. God, we pray that you would provide peace that transcends all understanding. God, we also ask that world leaders, God, that, God, that they would recognize who you are. God, that they would humble themselves, that they would seek your face. And God, as we humble ourselves, seek your face and pray, God, would you begin to heal our lands. God, we can't do this without you. We need your love. We need your peace. We need your guidance, and we need your wisdom. Father, would you provide that in abundance to those who need it? And God, we, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you will do. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for being with us today. If you're joining us here on our Paradise location or if you're joining us online, we just wanted to say thank you so much for spending a few moments with us today. We're super excited about everything that God's going to do in your life this, uh, throughout this service as Pastor Chris gets up to teach us in just a second. If you are here and it's your first time joining us today, uh, one, we just want to say thank you so much for being here with us. But also, if you'll take out your phone real quick and scan the QR code in the seat back in front of you. Uh, through that QR code, it's going to give you a little bit of information about who we are as a church. And we would love to connect with you through that. If you're joining us online, you can find the same information if this is your first time joining us. And you can do that through the link that's going to be in the chat box that the online host is posting right now. And again, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you so much for joining us and being here with us this morning. As a church, we love to pray with you. We love to pray for you. One of our core values as a staff is prayer. So every single Monday morning, we gather as a staff and we pray. We pray for our communities. We pray for this church. We pray for you specifically. And if you have prayer requests that you submit to us, we pray for each of those individually. If you have something you would like for us to pray with you or for you about, you can submit those to us at prayer at gf.church or through the QR code located on the seat back in front of you. Every single Tuesday night at 6 p.m., we have a prayer gathering in the atrium. If you'd like to be a part of that prayer gathering, we would love to welcome you to be a part of that this week. And we're going to be praying for each other. We're going to be praying for our communities, our leaders, and for our church. In just one second, I just wanted to just say thank you so much for your generosity. Your generosity allows us to do so many things in our communities, to shine the light of Jesus, and to be for our communities. So thank you so much for your generosity. If you would like to continue partnering with us in your generosity, we would like to invite you to do that through the QR code on the seat back in front of you or through the Church Center app. Or if you're located here on our Paradise campus right now, you can use one of the generosity boxes located around the auditorium. Your generosity allows us to do so many things, and one of those things it allows us to do is to help people take next steps in their relationship with Jesus. One of the biggest next steps we like to celebrate is baptism, and after this service, we're going to be celebrating baptisms, and we'd love for you to celebrate that with us for a few moments. I know that right now we have six people signed up to do that, 
And right now, if you're sitting here thinking that, man, I want to I want to get baptized, I need to take that next step. This is your invitation. So we would love for you to be a part of that baptism celebration immediately after this service. So if you want to do that, you can go right through those glass doors when we get done here. Talk to someone and we'll get you signed up and ready to go for that baptism celebration. But we also want to celebrate all that God's done through the lives who took next steps last month in baptism. So for the next couple of minutes, watch this video. Growing up, I did not grow up in a religious household at all. You know, we didn't go to church, just never really spoke about much in our family. At about the age of 15, I was in a pretty bad car wreck with a lifelong friend, and he happened to pass away during that. So at that time, I questioned Jesus a lot of why he'd is why he'd do that. So for about 10 years probably, I just totally gave up on the fact of never went to church anymore, never prayed even to say I needed help. Kind of started dealing with it all on my own. And um, so I had, it took a pretty big toll on me. I was pretty broken. And then I met Haley. We started doing our marriage counseling with Mark. And so I just started I knew Mark a little more personally, so I started questioning him a lot more about stuff that I didn't know about. So at one of Haley and my uh, marriage counselings, Mark had asked us if you know, we had chosen to follow Jesus yet. And that's what Mark knew, because there's a lot of stuff that I wanted to learn that I didn't really know about Jesus yet. So I felt like I wasn't really able to follow him yet because I didn't know a lot of stuff I was unaware of or didn't know about yet. So I remember him telling me that, you know, there's, you don't have to know everything to have to, to be able to follow Jesus. So that's the night that I decided to start following Jesus. I started going to church, Grace Fellowship, when it started at the Bridgeport High School, and we kind of grew with Grace. Being a teenager, wanting to sleep in, um, it wasn't, wasn't a priority to me. I had just turned 21. Um, I got pregnant, and it was, it was not the time that I would have wanted that for myself. Um, I was not in the best position um, with with the person that I was with. And once I finally accepted that this is how my life is, you know, about to change, I suffered a miscarriage and lost the baby. And it was a very quick chapter for me. I suffered two more miscarriages after that. I got pregnant in 2020. I was praying every single day um, for my unborn child, but not only for my unborn child, I was praying for my health. I got to deliver a healthy baby boy when I found out that I was pregnant for the fourth time I realized that something needed to something needed to change um, that I I'm missing something and that something that I'm missing was God. And that's when I made the decision to stop living my life my way and start living my life His way. Growing up, me and my family would go to church every Sunday. I know when I was going in high school, I was listening to the message, but I never like fully applied that stuff to my life. Um, 
So then when I, after I graduated and when I went to college, I went to play basketball and I also worked um, at a PT clinic on Sundays was like the only day that I didn't have like practice or games or just like homework to do. So I would just kind of use those days as like relaxing and just kind of recovering my body and preparing for the next week. So most Sundays I would skip church and just not go. When the pandemic happened, I had to move back home. One day my friend had called me and was just telling me like what she did that day. And she was saying how she had just finished one of like her devotionals that she started back in January. I remembered that I had this box in the top of my closet and I got it down and it had this like booklet and this little quiet time, time journal that I had from Bible study back in like intermediate school. In the process of reading the devotionals and just praying every single morning, I knew that I was missing Jesus in my life. And so through reading it and just kind of reading different scriptures that kind of connected to little pieces in my life and things that I could relate to. I just knew that that was where just being in His Word is where I could find my identity and just purpose and the direction that I needed to go in my life was through Jesus. My name is Morgan Davidson and today I am telling everyone that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. My name is Haley Davidson, and today I'm telling everyone that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. My name is Blake Lewis, and today I'm telling everyone that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Yeah, hey, I love celebrating what God is doing in people's lives. Don't you love hearing their stories? Let's celebrate that again. Welcome to Grace. My name's Chris. Whether you're here in paradise or those online, I'm glad you're here today. We're wrapping up a series we've been calling Marriage Matters. Before we do, I want to tell you, tell you this. Next week, we're starting a new series called Functional Faith, where we're going to begin walking through the book of James and look at how faith should affect. How does it function in everyday life? Life. So one of the things you can do to prepare for next week is this week just read through James chapter 1. Read through it once or twice, however many times you want to. Just read through it and, and, and get ready because next week we're going to be starting with James chapter 1. But today, as we wrap up the series on marriage, I hope it's been good for you. And I hope you haven't checked out regardless of where you are in marriage. Because whether you're single, divorced, or, or married, here's what I know. Is that what marriage does is it tells us about God's love for us. And here's what I also know is that so often the reason people struggle with the idea or the concept or have negative feelings towards marriage is because we have not approached marriage the right way. And as a result, they have not functioned the way that we want them to. And so it's brought pain and frustration and hurt into our lives that, that, that maybe uh, we could have missed had marriage happen the way that God designed it. And here's what I know is that no one starts marriage hoping for a divorce. And I want you to know, if you've walked through that, there is no shame here. Uh, that, that I know that, that life happens. And, and the thing is, is I also know that God wants to heal you and restore you and help you see his love even through all of that. But as we've looked at this series, here's what I hope. I hope that it helps us refocus what God meant when he created and designed marriage. And hopefully it sets, it sets us up to experience the marriage that God wants us to have. Now, if you're new to church, you're new to, to, to this God thing, you wouldn't even consider yourself religious. It is great that you're here. I want you to know that what we're going to talk about, that, that there's a lot of principles in it today, that if you apply them to your life, it would make your life better. It would make your marriage better. Because here's the thing that I've found, is that following Jesus makes life better and makes me better at life, period whether you believe in God or not. So I hope today as we wrap this up that maybe God will speak to you and, and help change and form the way that you see marriage, but more importantly, the way that you understand his love for you. Hey, let's pray and ask God to guide us in our time together. God, will you speak to us today? Holy Spirit, move in this place. We ask that you would come. Uh, come fill our hearts and God... 
that you would speak through me, Holy Spirit, so they won't hear me, but they would hear you. Because your words have life. Uh, your, your words are truth. And uh, your words bring hope. So God, will you speak today? Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to tell you a funny quirk about me um, is that I'm not a paper plate kind of guy. I don't like them. I don't like to eat on them. And I have a lot of reasons why. I can make a pretty good case for it, okay? For one, when you load them up and you like to eat, you load them up and you start walking around, they become flimsy and you're asking for disaster. Not only that, you put something on it like a nice warm steak or, or, or syrup, it comes soggy. And that's no good for anybody. Or if you try to cut through it, right, you cut through your plate and then you have a mess on your hands, all right? I don't like paper plates. You know what else? Is if you put food on it, you put it on a cold counter, it gets your food colder a lot faster because there's no insulation. I've got a lot of reasons why paper plates are no good. And I know you're saying, this guy is crazy. I'm not doubting that at all, all right? I'm just saying I have my reasons. But you have a reasons why you like paper plates, right? They're so much easier to deal with, right? No dishes. Who likes to do dishes? When you, you use it till it's no good, and then you get rid of it and get a new one, right? But I also have good reasons why I like a permanent plate, right? It's way more permanent, way more dependable. It helps insulate your food, keep your food warm. It, it, it's, it, it's not going to you know, following, it does require a little bit more work, but in my humble but correct opinion, it's much better. <laughs> now, here's what I would say. I think one of the biggest problems with marriages today is that we have paper plate kind of marriages. Now, here's what I mean. I'm not talking about what you try to eat on. I'm talking about we, we use it until it's no good, and then we get rid of it and get a new one. It's the way we think about marriage that, hey, I, I don't really want a marriage that takes much work or, or I need a low-maintenance kind of marriage kind of solution. And so we just, we, we'll just use something until it requires a little bit of work, a little bit of effort on our part, and then we'll just get rid of it and get a new one. I see our problem with our marriages today is we've begun to accept a consumer mentality when it comes to relationships and marriages, it's, it, we live in a consumer culture. Sociologists uh, believe that this mindset has, has happened over time because our lives have been so dominated by the marketplace that has created an uncertainty in, in relationships and in all kinds of things that were once thought to be permanent. It, it's, it's created what is called the commodification of relationships. The commodifications. This is the process in which social relationships have been reduced to basic economic exchange of emotional needs. You meet my emotional needs, I'll meet your emotional needs. If you're not meeting my emotional needs, I'm not going to meet your emotional needs. It's created when it comes to marriage what is considered the consumer relationship. The consumer relationship says uh, this relationship will last as long as you meet my needs at an acceptable cost. Here's a problem with that. When someone else comes along who, who, who uh, offers to meet your needs at a lower cost, you're gone. Not only that, the, the other problem with this is that at, at some point, if that relationship is not meeting your needs at an acceptable cost, you cut your losses and you move on. If it requires a little bit more love, a little bit more affection than what you're getting in return... We just use it till it's no good and get rid of it. We have these consumer relationships. And, and because of it, our relationships become unstable, unfulfilling, and unpredictable. And in our culture today, I believe it's the reason why people refuse to get married or, or don't even like marriage. They have negative feelings towards marriage because they've experienced the pain associated with consumer relationship types of marriages. It's why people say, I love you, but I'm not ready to get married. Or, or I, I don't believe in marriage. It just complicates things because what they're saying is, I love you, but I'm not ready to cut off all my other options. That's why people say, well, why do I have to get married uh, to, to love someone? Why do I need a piece of paper? Because in my experience, that piece of paper only complicates things. It may even be more damaging because what they've experienced is the pain of marriage that has affected the way they see marriage. You see, our consumer approach has caused us to believe that marriage is the problem. 
And in this series, and specifically today, I want us to see that marriage isn't the problem. Our approach to marriage is. The way we see marriage, the way we think about marriage, the way we operate in marriage. Because marriage is supposed to be something that provides stability to our lives because of a promise of love both now and in the future. But to experience that kind of marriage, we've got to change the way we approach it. Now, I want to say this before I go much further. I want you to know that I'm not saying that everybody needs to get married. There's been some pretty significant people in history who've lived pretty impactful, significant lives and and, and died single. Jesus might be one of those. I would say so. You don't have to be married to live a significant life. And I would also say this, just because you're dating someone doesn't necessarily mean you need to marry that someone. Because probably there's some relationships that just need to end because you're in a consumer relationship and they're no good for you. You're no good for them. And it's not going in a good direction. And you probably just need to cut it off. But here's what I am saying. Is that if we are going to have marriages that last the test of time and communicate God's love to the world then we've got to stop settling for paper plate kind of marriages and go for ones that are way more permanent. And it starts with understanding God's design for marriage and his desire for marriage. We've been looking at this the last couple of weeks uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at that again. The guy who's writing it is a guy named Paul. He, he, he hated Christianity, tried to wipe it out. God changed his life when he experienced with them. And then God used him to start many of the early churches and write many of the letters that we have today explaining how to live out our faith. And in Ephesians chapter 5, he's talking about how, how the Holy Spirit should change the way we live in every area of our life. And in in Ephesians 5, starting with verse 21, he becomes very specific about marriage. And we've been looking at this. I want us to look at it together, starting with verse 21. It says, And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Pastor Rocky talked about this last week, that it needs to be a submission competition, that you're rushing to the end of the line, that you turn off the scoreboard, you stop keeping score. If you miss that, you need to go online. It was good. If you, if you want your toes stepped on, go, go look at it, all right? It's good. But then he changes and he starts getting very personal and talks about the specific roles in marriage. And I want us to look at that together. He says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. We're going to talk about why that's important in just a second. It says, for a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. He goes on and says, as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands, look at what it says, in everything. Now this is probably a passage of scripture some of us like to skip. Because we don't really love the words here. But this is what he's saying. He's saying, wives, let your husband lead. Let your husband lead. Don't just let your husband lead. Celebrate his leadership encourage him, build him up in his leadership, ask him questions about meaningful things and listen to his response without correcting him and telling him the right way to think. The guys are chuckling nervously. (laughs) Do you know why it's so difficult to do this? Do you know why I think God tells wives specifically to let your husband lead? I think it goes all the way back to the first sin and the curse of sin. Because God's directive to the woman at the time was, hey, your curse is that you're going to struggle with the leadership of your husband. You're going to desire to be head over your husband. You know why it's difficult to let your husband lead? Because it's the sin. It's the flesh in you resisting God's design. So God goes, hey, I know this is going to be difficult for you, but here's what you need to do. If you want a marriage that matters, wives, you've got to let your husband lead. But what if he doesn't lead the way he's supposed to? See, I think that's why he says, as to the Lord. Submit to your husband as to the Lord. Because he's saying, listen, you don't follow his lead because he's the perfect leader. You follow his lead out of obedience to God. It's not about him. 
See, he says, follow your husband, unless it's going to lead into sin, that you follow your, your husband's lead out of obedience to God. And at this point, it's no longer a, a, a marriage issue, it's a faith issue. Do you trust God enough to do what he tells you to do and trust him with the outcome? It's not a marriage issue. It's a faith issue. Are you willing to trust God that he will bless your obedience, that he will use you in that relationship if you will trust him? Wives, he says, let your husbands lead. Wives, you can relax. It's the husband's turn. It says, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Look what he says. That's your standard. Just as Christ, right? It's not because you're, you're doing it better than the guys at work. You're doing it better than, than your buddies. You're doing it. No, just as Christ. That's our measure. That's our standard. What did he do? He gave up his life for her. <laughs> He gave up her, his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. That he's saying, listen, you should live in such a way that pushes and leads your, your wife to want to know and follow Jesus more. That you, you should lead in a way, spiritually taking the steps of going, look, I'm not perfect, but I want to serve you. I want to lead in a way that makes you desire to know and follow Jesus more. He goes on. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. And he says this, in the same way, husbands ought to love. Like it should be your response to what Jesus did for you. Your natural response. You ought to love your wife as they love their own bodies. That you take care of her as you would take care of yourself and beyond. He says, for a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. And he says, look, no one hates his own body, but feel, feeds and cares for it. Just as Christ cares for the church. That you, you, you take care of her like the basic needs and beyond. You want her to thrive. It says, and we are members of this, of his body. So wives, let your husbands lead. But you know what he's saying to husbands? Husbands, lead like Jesus. Lead like Jesus. Lead with love. Jesus didn't take a position of authority and say, everybody has to do this for me. No, he got down on his knees and he washed feet. He laid down his life on a cross. Lead like Jesus out of love, unconditional love, no strings attached love. Not, not I will do this for you if you meet my needs, but I'm going to love you like Jesus. I'm going to sacrifice my pride, my desires, my, what I think are my rights so that I can love you like Jesus. I'm going to serve you the way that Jesus served the church. He says, yeah, husband, you're, you're the head of the wife, but because of Jesus' example, you know what that means? It means you're the head dishwasher, floor sweeper, laundry folder, gas pumper, bed maker, toilet scrubber, carpet cleaner, and kid wrangler. It, it means that when your, your, your wife wants to go do something with her friends or she has something she needs to do, you don't ask the question, well, what am I supposed to do with the kids? I've got that answer. Be a dad. You had a hand in it. You were there. Be a dad. Listen, when your wife... Needs you to do something to, to, to help. Don't be asked. Go first. Our culture and our churches and marriages today need men who will be courageous enough to step into their calling and lead like Jesus. I'll just pause and say this. Our church needs men who will step up and lead like Jesus. We have small groups in, in elementary and intermediate and junior high and high school who need men who will just step in and say, I don't need a title. I just need a place to change the next generation by, by being Jesus to someone. We need men like that in our church, so I know we need men like that in our families. I know we need men like that in our marriages. See, see, our culture has lied to us and told us that manliness is about money and possessions and power and sexual prowess and titles. But that's not what manliness is about. Manliness, manliness is refusing to be mastered by those things. 
Being married doesn't make you less manly. I actually believe it calls you to be more manly. It's a call to put away childish, selfish behavior and learn restraint so that you can courageously care for your wife the way that God wants you to, the way God designed you to, the way that God designed marriages to work. To love her just as Christ loved the church. And single men, if the reason you're not getting married is because you aren't ready to eliminate your options, listen, you aren't ready for a relationship. You need to break it off and take some time to ask God to change you into the man of God he needs you to be so that you can lead your wife and your family in a way that honors God and honors her. We need men. And I want you to know this. I'm not coming down on men. I'm just preaching to you the way that God's preached to my heart. I'm right here with you. I'm just sharing from my heart what God is saying to me. Because I know this, if our marriages are going to be meaningful and fulfilling, we've got to learn to lead like Jesus. And here's what I know. There is not a woman out there who wouldn't want to follow a man who leads like Jesus. Make it easy for her to follow you. Wives, let your husband lead. Husbands, Lead like Jesus. And now that I've got everyone mad at me, let's keep going. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But then it goes on and says this. This is a great mystery. It is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. That that you need to do your part if it's going to work out. And and we talked about this the first week, that this is the secret of marriage. That marriage was meant to mirror the love of Christ. But in these last two verses, I think we also see the power of marriage. He says that, that the power of marriage is that the two would become one and never be undone. The two would become one and never be undone. That they would leave their family, they would be joined together. The word he uses there, to be joined together, literally means be glued together. Permanent. My dad growing up would make things out of wood and he'd use dowel rods a lot of times to connect the pieces together. And when you put those things together, you put glue uh, in those dowel rod holes and you squeeze them together. And when it dries, for you to take it apart, it's going to damage all the pieces that were meant to be put together. And listen, that's why divorce hurts so bad. Because it was meant to be permanent. And when it's pulled apart, it damages all the pieces involved. And I want you to know, God can heal that. He wants to heal that. He wants to restore you. But I also want you to know, that's never what God meant for it to be. He wanted the two to become one and never be undone. See, the power of marriage is in the promise of permanence. It's in the stability that it provides of saying, man, I love you not just today, but every day for the rest of my life. If we're going to experience that power of marriage in our life, we've got to change the way we approach marriage. We've got to stop treating it like paper plates where we just use it till it's no good. But that we care for it. That we do what we need to make sure it's in a good shape. They were careful with it. We've got to change the way we approach it. We've got to shift our thinking from a consumer relationship to a covenant relationship. And and here's what I mean. A consumer relationship, like we talked about earlier, is basically what's good for the individuals is most important. But in a covenant relationship, what's good for the relationship is most important. A covenant in Scripture wasn't just physically binding. It was spiritually binding. And in marriage, it is double binding because you're making a covenant but before God, a covenant with God, and a covenant with the other person. They are interconnected, and that's why if your relationship with God is off, it is hard to love your spouse the way that God intended you to. And it's also why if your relationship with your spouse is off, it feels as if your relationship with God is off. They are interconnected. It's double binding. And a covenant relationship was something that was made that was intended to never end. But what happens if we don't love each other anymore? See, I think the error is in our definition of love. Because this is, this is our thought when it comes to love, is that we measure love 
by our emotional desire for someone's affection. How much I want to be loved by someone. How much I want to feel affection from someone. I, I want this person to love me back. I desire to be loved by you. So the problem is when that person becomes less desirable, so does our passion and emotion and feelings. See, true love, true love isn't about how much you want to receive affection, but how much you are willing to give of yourself. That's the kind of love Jesus demonstrated. That's the picture of love that God put in place when he sent Jesus to the earth. Think about it. Jesus said, hey, uh, no greater love has anyone than this than they would lay down their life for someone else. And that's what he did for us. It, It tells us that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. It cost him something. He did not love us because we were lovely. He loved us to make us lovely. See, real love isn't how much I feel or how much passion I have. Because the problem with feelings and passion and emotion and all those things are not bad. God gave them to us. But the problem with them is they're unreliable. And we can't control them. But what we can control are our choices. You can control your choices. Now, culturally speaking, we think that, you know what, you have to feel love to act loving. But the truth is that consistent acts of love will lead to consistent feelings of love. That the acts of love will stir the emotion and affections of love. See, real love is continuing to love even when the other person is unlovely. And if you truly love someone... There should be no hesitation to, to, make, to, to make a decision, to make that relationship permanent and exclusive through the relationship of marriage. Because you desire to love them the way that God loves you. Because that's the way marriage is supposed to be. That's what marriage is supposed to be. Not paper plate kinds of marriage, but permanent decisions, permanent relationships that last a lifetime. If we want a marriage that matters, a marriage that is meaningful, that the, prom- the power of that marriage, the power of marriage is in the promise of permanence. To do that, we've got to do some things in our lives to change the way we approach marriage. First of all, you've got to prioritize it. Listen, you prioritize things every single day. And, and the reality is that we've got to get our priorities right. God first, spouse second, everyone and everything else after that. You have priorities whether you admit it or not. And most of the time, you're, you're the priority. What you want. What you desire. The me before we. But it starts with your relationship with God. If you're going to ever be able to love your spouse and experience the fullness of marriage, it starts with you growing in your relationship with God. That, that it starts with a relationship, putting your faith in Jesus. That's where you start. But then learning to grow on a daily basis in your relationship with God. Only then will you be able, through his help, to love your spouse the way that God wants us to love our spouse. And here's the deal. I'm not telling you to do something that we don't want to help you with. We have two two great resources at the church to help people know what does it look like to grow in faith. You didn't have to grow up in a in a faith background. We we want to walk alongside you and help you in that journey. We have two resources. One, the starting point class. If you're so new that you're not even sure which way's up in your Bible when you open it, that is the class for you. Fantastic place to start. It's about a four-week course. You can sign up for it through the QR code. Another class is our grow classes. The reason we push this so much is that we want to inspire and equip people to know and follow Jesus. This is the way that we want to equip people to give them tools and resources to know how to grow in their relationship with Jesus. And we want to help you do that because here's what we know. If your relationship with your wife's going to change, it's got to start with your relationship with God. That's your first priority. Your second priority is your spouse. Before your kids, before your kids' activities, is your spouse. Before the busyness of your job, your spouse. Before your hobbies, your spouse. Because here's the deal. One day those kids are going to leave and you're just going to be stuck with each other. And that's not the way you want it to feel. 
You want to be ready to kick them out of the house because you can't wait to be alone with your wife or your husband again. You want to throw a party when they leave. But the only way that happens, the only way that happens is that you prioritize your marriage. That you, You prioritize it above everything else. Second thing is this, is that you invest in it. And what I would say about this, you invest in it personally. You do your part. At the end of that, it says, hey, Husbands, you need to love your wife, and wives, you need to respect your husband. You do your part. In the book, Love and Respect, there was a study done in, uh, of spouses, and in, in, of the 7,000 uh, people interviewed, they were asked, when you're in conflict with your spouse, do you feel um, <clears throat> unloved or do you feel disrespected? And 82% of the men said, I feel disrespected. And 72%, I'm sorry, 83% of the men, 72% of the women said they felt unloved. You know what that tells us? is that men understand love through respect. And women, a lot easier than we think it is, they understand love by love. (laughs) You you know, God tells men to love their wives. You know why? Because it's not natural to us to love unconditionally. Because we're naturally really selfish looking out for number one. He says, hey, die to yourself and start loving your wife the way that Jesus loves you. Because the way their relationship works is it's, they have this relational air tank. And when you act unloving and make unloving decisions, it's like you're standing on their air, air hose, gasping for air, and that relationship is dying. And women, he says, hey, wives... Respect your husband. You go, well, I love him, but I just don't respect him. That's the same of him saying, I respect her, but I just don't love her. That's what it means to men. Is that you would choose to respect him out of obedience to God. And here's what I know. No man feels fond feelings toward a woman who he thinks despises him as a human being. So the way they talk... So the facial expressions they give, the things that they say, or the silent treatment they give, no man feels love when they are disrespected. Husbands, love your wife. Wives, respect your husband. Do your part. Then also a way to invest in it is learn to speak their love language. There's a book by, by uh, Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. Uh, these are the five acts of service, touch, quality time, gifts, words of affirmation. In the book, he talks about the idea that we all understand love in different ways, and these are the ways that we understand them. What's funny is a lot of times God likes to put people together who, who speak completely different love languages, like complete opposites. And there's a lot of resources to figure out what's your love language, but it's not enough to to know it, you've got to learn to speak it. Several years ago, I was in Guatemala on a mission trip. We were doing some feeding centers for kids, and we'd play soccer with them afterwards. And what's funny is uh, we had a blast, but they didn't speak my language. I didn't speak their language. So you know what we did? We just talked slower and louder. (laughs) And it didn't work. Go figure. But isn't that what we do in marriage? I'm speaking love. You should understand that. We never learn to speak their love language. Invest in it by learning their love language and then choosing to intentionally speak their love language. Some other things, real quick. You, you, You should pray for your spouse. Pray together. Prayer is not a scary thing. It is talking to someone. Just like having a conversation. It is as simple as saying, hey, God, um, will you help me be the husband or wife that you, you need me to be? God, will you, will you move in my husband's life? Will you move in my wife's life? And praying together, God, will you help us have the marriage that honors you and that tells the story of what God has done in our lives? It's just talking to God as simple as that. 
Some other things that I encourage people to do, go to counseling. That's one of the best things my wife and I ever did is we went to Christian counseling. It helped us tremendously. There's no reason. Weak people don't need counseling. Wise people do. Go get counseling. Get help. Do a Bible study together. There's, we got some great resources on our resources link where you can click on it and, and you don't have to know anything about the Bible. It does all the, the, the Bible study for you. you. You listen together. You talk about it. It's fantastic. Serve together. Maybe read a book together. One of the best books on marriage I've ever read. I use it in premarital counseling. Uh, we use a lot of pieces of it for this series. It's The, the Meaning of Marriage by Timothy Keller. Now, here's the thing. You go, all right, how do I get all this? We, on, on the gf.church slash links or the QR code, there's a, a tab for, for resources page. Go there. Be committed to, to, to your marriage enough to invest in it so that you can have a marriage that matters. And the last thing is this. Commit to it. Commit to it. Commit to it with a true till death do us part attitude. That means protect it at all costs. To do that, you've got to burn the ships. Let me explain that. In 1519, Spanish conquistador Hernando Cortes landed in Mexico with a few hundred men and 11 ships. His goal was to seize the treasure of the Aztecs. This wasn't the first time this had been attempted. But for over 600 years, the Aztecs had been able to defeat every attempt. But this time was different. And what made it different was a three-word command. That he gave to his troops as they were leaving the ships. He said, burn the ships. And the reason that made the difference is he said, look, there is no plan B. There is no way out. It isn't win or go home. It's when if I ever want to go home. There was no turning back. There was no escape plan. It was 100% commitment. If we want marriages that matter, we've got to make that kind of commitment to marriage. That, that we would cut off any plan B. That, that, that we would uh, make a t- true till death do us part kind of commitment. Re- remove the, the, the word divorce from your vocabulary. That's not something you throw around or you joke about. That, that it doesn't even exist. That for some of you it means that you need to delete social media so you stop fantasizing by, about other people's uh, highlight real relationships. Maybe it's so that you cut off the, the, the conversation that's ha- happening in your direct messages that you hope that your spouse never finds out about. That, that maybe it means that you need to cut off communications or text messages with that person. Maybe it's that you need to stop looking at pornography because it's killing your marriage whether you know it or not. And if you're struggling with that, get help because it's taking down your marriage. That, that you would change jobs if there's a relationship there that, that, that is at risk of taking down the permanent relationship and commitment that you made. That you would create distance and that you would end it, that you would burn the ships. That's what it means to commit to marriage. Commit to it, yeah. Because here's the deal, only then will you experience the power of marriage. Because the power of marriage is in the promise of permanence. If we're ever going to have that, we're going to have a marriage that's not just a paper plate, that we use it till it's no good and then we get rid of it. We have a marriage that really matters and lasts and is dependable. We've got to shift the way we think about marriage, the way we approach marriage, the way we do marriage. In his book, Meaning of marriage, Timothy Keller said it this way. He says, you must stick to your commitment to act and serve and love even when, no, especially when, you don't feel much delight and attraction to your spouse. That's the difference between a covenant relationship and a consumer relationship. It's a choice. A choice that you make to act loving even when you don't feel And then he says this, the love you will grow into will be wise, richer, deeper, and less variable. What if that was the way that people looked at our marriage? What if that's the kind of marriages we had? Isn't that the kind of marriage that we long for? Isn't that the kind of marriage you want for your kids? The power of marriage is in the permanence of marriage. 
but we've got a way that got to change what we do if we're going to get a different result. Today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, I want you to know this. You can have marriage and you can make it, but I don't think you'll ever experience the full meaning, purpose, satisfaction of marriage without Jesus. So maybe that's your first step. And today, if, if you go, man, I need that relationship, there'll be people down front that would love to talk to you about it. People in the hub, if you're watching online, the host would love to talk to you about it because that's your first step. We want to walk with you through that. And maybe you're going through a tough time in marriage. We'd love to talk with you about that. Help get resources in your hand. Because I believe God's desire for grace is that it would be a place where people grow marriages that last the test of time and tell the story of God's grace and love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your kindness to us. Now, God, will you help us trust you in faith to do our part? Become the men and women of God that you want us to be. And that we just trust you. And we would do what you tell us to do. And trust you with result. And I pray, God, that you would build the kind of marriages. And the families in this church... That God changed everything. They changed a generation. They changed communities. They changed the world. As they tell the story of your grace and love. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wasn't that a great message today? Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Chris. He mentioned a few resources that we have made available to you, and those are going to come through uh, Right Now Media. If you haven't signed up for your Right Now Media account, it's something you can sign up for free, and we'd love for you to access that. You can do that at gf.church, go to Next Steps Resources, then click the link there to register for Right Now Media. It's an awesome resource, uh, and it goes beyond just marriage resources. Uh, it just goes into anything that deals with your spiritual walk, um, Bible studies, different things like that. So please take advantage of that amazing tool, and we'd love for you to access that for free. One event I want you to be aware of is our Spring Break Bounce. That's going to be Wednesday, March 16th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. This is going to be a free event for you and your toddler through fifth grade uh, student. Uh, We're going to have a bunch of bounce houses uh, in the atrium as well as outside, weather permitting. It's going to be an awesome day for you and your your child to just hang out together and do something fun. So if you want more information on that, it'll be there on our website at gf.church. You can check that out. Just in just a moment, as we leave here, we're going to go out into the atrium and we're going to celebrate baptism. And uh, we're so excited about that. Before the service knew there were six people. Uh, If you're someone who says, man, I need to make that next step. Don't miss out on that today. You can leave right now as I'm talking and go through the hub, talk to somebody. We'll get you signed up for baptism, and we'd love for you to take that next step. If you are getting baptized, you can go ahead and head out now and get uh, ready for that if you haven't already. Um, but we're so excited about the lives who are going to be, uh, who, are, who are declaring that Jesus is Lord of their life, and they want their church and their families to know about that. If you want to pray with somebody today, if there's something going on, and you want to do that, you can do that up here at the front with our prayer partners. Uh, but we are so grateful that you joined us today, both here at our Paradise location and for those of you who joined us online. Thank you so much for being here, and we can't wait to see you next week. Y'all have a great week.